Welcome. Uh, thanks for coming to the talk. Uh, I'll be giving a brief uh, overview of a project that I'm working on. It's a working work in progress. Uh, it's namespacing in SE Linux. Uh, and this is about uh, adding an SE Linux namespace so that SE Linux plays a bit better with namespacing. Uh, who am I? I'm the guy who missed the door prize this morning. <laughs> so I've heard. Uh, Hopefully it wasn't an Xbox, otherwise my, my kids are going to kill me. They've uh, turned into Ewoks, they've been watching Return of the Jedi, and they'll probably slingshot me to death when I come home. Uh, I'm the uh, Linux security subsystem maintainer. I've previously worked on several uh, security projects within the kernel. Um, I'm a recovering manager. I've spent a few years uh, doing some management at Oracle on the, uh, the, the kernel team there. I'm now back, transitioning back into uh, more direct Kernel development. Uh, I've got some social media. I've got a blog. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, and I'll post the slides from this at the end uh, of the talk. And so, just I'll give you. A, I'll do a very brief review of the technologies. Casey covered some of this this morning, so we can get across that more quickly. I'll assume that people here have a pretty good knowledge of security and kernels and namespacing. Uh, if you do have any questions, please feel free to to uh, put your hand up. Um, I'm just going to discuss some of the requirements that have emerged uh, and some uh, work that's ongoing or currently happening and then what needs to be done in the future. So this is probably going to be the, the shortest presentation on SE Linux ever. I guess most people put their hands up before and uh, have some experience with it. Uh, the, in, the term, in the context of this talk, uh, what's important to note is that uh, it's a label-based mandatory access control system. Uh, so by label-based we put security labels on all the objects and subjects in the system, the subject typically being a process and an object being something the process acts on, such as a file or another process. Uh, we define permissions about how these interact with each other based on those labels, which becomes the policy. Uh, this policy is centrally managed by an administrator, which is what makes it uh, mandatory, and it's enforced in the kernel level. And Casey mentioned security blobs. Uh, this is where we attach the labels to objects within the kernel, such as files, uh, inodes, sockets, and so on. Uh, SNX are generalized. It's a previously uh, mandatory access control had been uh, associated with the Department of Defense uh, rules, which were fairly strict and hard coded going back to the 80s. Uh, and with SNX, this is now generalized and it can meet a wide range of goals from a general purpose operating system, such as Fedora, where you are. Uh, protecting, trying to contain network facing services primarily if they become breached uh, and it's uh, in use in embedded systems, phones and through to military and uh, government use. Uh, and this is made possible by a separation of uh, policy and mechanism so that you can just change the security stance of the system by loading a new policy. Uh, the Linux security modules API or LSM uh, is what SN Linux hooks into. It's a kernel API, primarily for access control systems. Uh, and this is based on hooks, which are located throughout the kernel, uh, which uh, are at security decision points. Uh, and what happens is when some security relevant operation is occurring, we collect uh, information about essentially who's uh, doing what to who. And then we uh, present that in a race-free way uh, through the API to the security modules that are plugged in. Uh, the capabilities uh, code, for example, was, I think that might have been the first LSM uh, that was put in and then uh, that, that does some stacking with, uh, with the other uh, a special case stacking. So if you're familiar with NetFilter but not LSM, think of it a bit like uh, NetFilter but for the kernel, not just uh, packets. Uh, and it's pluggable just like NetFilter is. So you can imagine, say, IP tables being uh, something like SE Linux or you know, one of these applications that plugs in. Uh, namespaces. So I uh, won't go into a great deal of detail on namespaces. Uh, namespaces provide private views of global resources. Uh, so you can have a mount namespace where, for example, you want to have a private view of the temporary directory. So you, in a mount namespace, uh, you can mount that and no one else can see inside your temporary directory. There are other resources which are namespace such as networking, uh, IPC, and so on. Uh, there's Several things, several resources are not namespaced. Pretty much all of the security uh, APIs, uh, security uh, global features, 
including uh, LSM, uh, also key rings, set comp, time, quite a few things are not yet namespaced. Uh, and the uses of namespaces include sandboxes, uh, containers, multi-level security, interestingly, as a way to provide private views of directories uh, so that people can't see if a, if a certain file name has been created in a certain directory, for example, because that could leak information out. Uh, containers uh, are a figment of your imagination <laughs> and not a thing as I think we're very well established and uh, I get most of my information on containers these days actually from Jesse's publications so I think this is uh, thanks to thanks to Jesse for the information she publishes. Uh, so containers generally speaking are actually a combination of namespaces as we just mentioned, C groups which is about resource management and some sort of magic that makes your container system better than somebody else's, such as LXC or Docker and so on. Uh, they're very popular, as I guess everyone knows. Uh, and therefore, because we don't have uh, namespacing of security APIs in the kernel, uh, we therefore don't have very good support for uh, security in containers and being able to have, uh, say, private views of uh, security APIs. And this uh, may or may not be a problem. Uh, generally speaking, uh, when you have people running containers that are sort of operating system-like, uh, it limits the functionality of what you can achieve there. So yeah, obviously, if you really want a, your own operating system, you do type 2 or type 1 uh, virtualization, or you have individual computers. Uh, but there are still many common uses, which we'll get into in the use cases. Uh, where people want something very close to what they see as an operating system installation. Uh, for example, some of the restrictions we have are on Fedora-based distributions currently. Uh, SE Linux is actually running in the global uh, space. Um, and it is protecting what's going on inside the, con uh, with protecting what's happening across the entire system, including the containers. But from within a container, it appears that SE Linux is disabled. So that limits functionality. And, it's a bit of a hack uh, in that you can actually um, mount SE Linux FS. So SE Linux FS is the control API uh, for SE Linux. From within a container, you can mount that if you're in an unprivileged uh, container and then uh, control the global state of SE Linux. So it looks like it's disabled, but you can actually disable it or change the policy for everybody on the system. So some of these workarounds really are uh, problematic. So having some discussions with uh, people at conferences uh, and through work, uh, we're sort of collecting, and we, I mean the, the security community, whoever's on any of the mailing lists, for example, uh, some of the common use cases. In there, and for uh, SE Linux, it's the ability to uh, provide SE Linux confinement within the container. So you have SE Linux enforcing uh, globally across the whole system, but uh, as I mentioned, it appears disabled within the container. We have cases where people want to load their own policy and do SE Linux type things. Uh, one example, uh, another example is, uh, a concrete example is running, say, SE Linux enabled on the container but not uh, on the host, um, which sounds a bit odd, but you have situations where you have, for example, in Chrome OS, uh, you can run a, an Android SE Linux container. Uh, SE Linux is a feature of Android. Uh, so you want to be able to uh, have uh, individual SE Linux instances there. And one important uh, use case is to be able to have different policy and different versions of the same distro on the same host, and this in particular is, say, for build systems. So when you're building either RPMs or packages, or it could be uh, some sort of DevOps where you're doing testing and packaging up, uh, you may want to have, um, or probably want to have, different versions of the policy uh, running in the containers uh, for testing. Uh, you could be doing some development and you may want to have some custom policy that you're working on. Uh, so the, one of the, yeah, this is one of the drawbacks currently with containers. Uh, and there's some other cases, for example, there's a virtual smartphone system, Cellrox, based on the Cells research project, which has multiple Android instances on the same host and you might think, whatever would you use that for? Uh, apparently, this is so that you can have, say, a work phone and a personal phone on the same piece of hardware. So that's an example of people needing this. 
I should have mentioned cloud in there somewhere, sorry. Uh, so to drill down to actual specific requirements, and this now, I think we can say this is not necessarily, these requirements are not necessarily SE Linux specific. They would be well applicable to uh, other labeling systems such as SMAC, and uh, we'll be able to do some collaboration across the projects here. So the most, uh, the most general common requirement that we have is that we want to provide private kernel, uh, private versions of uh, kernel security APIs inside containers. Uh, in this case, I'm talking about SE Linux, but we also need to address other problems. Uh, for example, the set comp and the key rings that I mentioned. And specifically, if we're looking at uh, operating system-like behavior inside a container, we want to be able to load and enforce our own policy. We want to be able to have an independent enforcing mode, so it can be enforcing in the host or enforcing in the container, but not the other way around. We want to provide isolation from the global SE Linux instance, this idea of mounting SE Linux FS and playing with somebody else's security is probably not a good idea. Uh, and also from other containers, so these are, I guess, security requirements. Um, we want to be able to run different versions of policy on the same system. And we want to run uh, in a fully privileged mode. We don't want to be attached or depending on username spaces because this would then limit uh, SE Linux namespaces and containers then uh, to uh, unprivileged containers which then may not provide all of the uh, features of the operating system that the user wants. We also want to maintain orthogonality between uh, discretionary access control and mandatory access control. Uh, another thing here which I've put in italics, because it's not something I'm addressing at this uh, stage, which is to potentially have different distros running or, or different LSMs between the hosts and the containers. And this really starts to tie into the work that Casey's doing on stacking. So some combination of uh, full stacking and namespaces will probably be the path that that takes. But that's well off into a version two or something of this. Uh, so the first idea that I came up with, was the, with this was uh, to provide an LSM namespace, we just created an LSM namespace. Uh, and I discussed this at Plumbers um, last year and that was in the context of the security module stacking discussions. Um, it actually turns out to be a really bad idea and a really complicated idea. Uh, there's not enough semantic information at the LSM layer about what the modules actually want and what you want to do with the information. Uh, and um, you may recall from Casey's uh, talk that he actually has the, uh, the blobs moved out into the global uh, API, but then that API needs to actually do something with that that's intelligent for, for, all of the, uh, for all of the security modules. So essentially the real work would need to be done in the individual security modules, so SE Linux or SMAC would have to really understand what the namespacing uh, semantics look like. So then the idea was uh, to uh, perform the, um, perform the uh, namespacing within the individual security modules. So it turns out then that I found out that a prototype had already been written, a very basic prototype, with just a few small problems to solve. Uh, and this is developed by Stephen Smalley, who's the uh, leader of the SE Linux project. Uh, he's published that on GitHub. And essentially what the prototype does is it encapsulates the global SE Linux state. Uh, you create a SE Linux namespace just using the normal APIs or would if it was hooked up. Uh, and so the global state includes things like the policy database, uh, object uh, label mapping, how you actually map your security labels to specific objects. Uh, and these are passed to internal APIs which were previously operating on global information. Uh, and the internal API, this is called the security server, which comes from the, uh, the roots of the project as a hypervisor, oh, sorry, as a um, a microkernel project back in the 80s. So those APIs were basically still there and they've turned out to be very useful in already essentially being abstracted or ready to be abstracted. Uh, there's an initial SE Linux uh, namespace which is just created transparently, uh, init SE Linux NS. Uh, there are now per namespace uh, SE Linux file system instances. So if you, firstly you have to unshare your mount namespace and then you, once you've done that you create you mount a new SE Linux FS and write a one to a new node in there called unshare, which then uh, instantiates a new SE Linux FS. So this means that you have to uh, unshare your mount namespace for this. The access vector cache uh, 
was then moved into the namespace, which is, contains all of your live state re regarding cached decisions, sequence numbers, various things. And some per namespace support was then added for some of these objects that we have to label the security labels with all security blobs. Uh, so in memory inodes and super blocks, uh, creds, uh, the SE Linux names, uh, Netlink socket was namespace, which essentially just meant uh, including it in the namespace object for the networking namespacing code. This then requires you to unshare the network namespace. And for this to work, and the Netlink socket provides asynchronous communication. And uh, this is an example of it working, the, the prototype. Uh, there's a few steps being left out, just some workarounds for some issues that would make this even more complicated. Uh, as you can see, it just follows the steps I mentioned, write a one to the unshare node. In SE Linux FS, you unshare your mount and network namespaces. Uh, remount or mount your own SE Linux FS. So now at this point, you have in the kernel your own uh, SE Linux instance. You have your own control API through SE Linux FS. You then load your own security policy. You have to set your, um, uh, your current context. Everything's basically unlabeled. Uh, you may need to do some housekeeping there. And it comes up in uh, permissive mode. So one of the to-do items was uh, to actually extend this support to uh, files on disk. So the namespacing was already happening to the in-memory inodes. Um, but once you start it to disk, you actually have, this is a, disks are often a shared resource and you have some complications. Our security labels in SE Linux are implemented as uh, extended attributes under the security namespace as are, uh, say, the SMAC labels. We use uh, security.se Linux and there's some sort of uh, value goes in there and that's attached to the file. Uh, so we need some way to uh, have namespacing support here and namespace the labels themselves. So the approach I came up with and proposed was to actually add an NS name field to the end of the extended attribute name, which then you can put a label on it. It may be the same label or it may be something else. Uh, so what happens here is that on disk, now all the uh, Security labels have a, a namespace attribute, but your uh, applications don't see that. They just see uh, the raw labels uh, as if nothing else was happening. That way, uh, the global system can keep track of who owns which labels. So NS name can be anything. It can be a container name, a UUID. It can just be whatever you want, your star sign, phase of the moon. Uh, and you write that value to the unshare node instead of uh, one. This is uh, translated by the kernel, as I mentioned. It's uh, transparent, uh, so you don't need any application changes. So I've just highlighted the differences uh, for the example use. Uh, so now it's, uh, we're just creating a random name, NS1, for namespace one. Um, it has no meaning. It's completely opaque in the, in the kernel. And now uh, when you instantiate your uh, SLNX namespace, it now has this name attached to it, and you can cut that back out. Uh, when you create a file, uh, the thing in blue is the SE Linux label. The typical application is like ls, and it, and it gets that. Uh, but actually, the on disk inode, you can see, uh, or the on disk label now has an extra field. Uh, this is an administrative access. You wouldn't normally see that. Uh, so some of the feedback I had on that was that we need to track the namespace nesting so that we know really where the labels came from. An example is that you could create a container create a file and mark it top secret and actually really put top secret information in there. Uh, and then you kill your container, you've got this file lying around. We don't really know uh, who, who, who created that file and whether we should believe that label, uh, for example. So you can potentially leak information out. There's all kinds of issues that need to be solved. So uh, some of the things that need to be done is to uh, label files in ancestor namespaces. So as you work your uh, way up the, uh, the chain when you create a file in a container, all of the ancestors then need to put their own uh, security labels on. Um, we need to have nested policy enforcement that is um, enforcing two different policies over the same, or multiple different policies. Uh, we need rules for that and we also need to figure out how to handle inheritance of labels. I mean, it would be good, probably typically people would expect that when you create a container, you would just inherit all of the, uh, the, the labels on the files and actually all the objects. But we need to set up some rules for that. 
Um, and then we also need to take into account things like uh, read-only shared labels that might come from sharing user. And obviously you can't write to those if you're in a, in a, in a container. So I came out with the next version, which is just to provide uh, the nesting. So we're now keeping uh, all of the container or the namespace names uh, in the name of the namespace, sort of like a, a, a path name on a, on a file system. And the only difference, it's all exactly the same. Uh, this is an example where you're already in NS1 as we did before. You're now creating a, a container or a namespace inside of a namespace, uh, which is nested inside. And so we now know where uh, files have come from. Um, so if we create a new file, you'll see the file we created before. C is um, unlabeled at this point. We still don't know what to do with that, but our new file comes up as expected through LS. We can relabel it and then down the bottom, if you look at the on disk label um, for D, for the file D, you'll see now we have the nested labels. Um, so that again, we know, we know the chain of uh, trust, for example, that, that uh, was used to create that label. Uh, so the current work that I'm currently looking at is uh, supporting list et cetera properly. This is the system call. Uh, we need to be able to translate the namespace names for a list um, of extended attributes. And we need to make sure that people only see what they should be seeing. So if you have a, a file with a bunch of labels from different namespaces, uh, it's pretty ugly. Uh, it's, this list is created by the individual file system uh, implementation. So in XFS, it's down in the bowels of the XFS code. In ext 4 it's done down there. Um, so there's two ways. One is to actually have that file system call back into through LSM and request a, a translation decision, like here's what I'm about to do, what do you think about that? Or um, actually just rewrite the entire list at the end uh, in SE Linux or Smack or whatever. Uh, they're both pretty ugly. If anyone's got any brilliant ideas on this, uh, let me know, because both of them are layering violations and are probably likely to get Christoph Helwig, uh, his, his wrath at least. Uh, and future work is essentially to take the, that feedback from the, um, the on-disk extended attributes and apply that across uh, all of the objects, sockets, uh, networking, packets, uh, all kinds of things that we need to, to work on. We need to look at how we inherit existing objects such as open file descriptors, uh, and we need to consider uh, working on namespaces that are, are not our current namespace, uh, working on behalf of uh, some other credentials. Uh, we're not anywhere near that yet. Uh, and also some of the hooks are not being invoked in process context uh, because we're instantiating on the fly rather than uh, normally SE Linux is uh, initialized at boot and there's a bunch of initialization that happens there. Uh, sometimes when we're working on the fly, we're gonna get uh, situations uh, where we have uninitialized uh, objects in terms of the namespace uh, and we can't sleep. So we'll be in, in uh, IRQ context or something at this point, and we can't sleep to read off the disk or perform an allocation. So, and also logging. So there's some really, uh, really interesting problems to solve there. Um, I have some more information on drilling down into the into open issues. I won't get into those here. There's a boff tomorrow. There's some security people hanging out, and I'll be around. Uh, for the next couple of days. So if anyone want, wants to get into, into deeper discussions, I'm sure Casey does, uh, let me know. So I guess we've got a bit of time for any questions. Um, we probably have time for one question. Um, by the way, if you are looking to move to another mini-conf uh, for the next time slot, right now would be a great time to do that. Um, but we'll take one question. Okay, thanks. I'm just wondering, since the uh, namespace that you're in is set by an et cetera, can you have a file with two separate namespaces and is that a good idea? That's, that's what this is trying to solve is, yeah, you, let's say you have a file and you, it's an existing file and it's in the global namespace uh, and then you want to be able to have multiple uh, security labels on that file based on that, uh, which container created it. Uh, so yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting problem. And essentially what we want to do is make sure that each uh, 
each namespace enforces its own policy on its own labels. And then at the global level, there needs to be probably a, uh, a, some sort of reasoning about all of these interactions. So yeah, you really need to be able to say, do we trust this person to create a namespace with this particular uh, type of label? So yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting project. It does seem to actually work, <laughs> so, so far. Okay, um, thank you very much, James.